Welcome to a vellum presentation. We are here today to talk about how to set up some simple cloth on a character. And we're going to make this a little bit more complicated though, because we're going to start off with a character, but with no actual cloth. So I'm going to start off with the file shop to see what we have to work with. So in this imaginary situation, and hopefully we will provide you with these files to start with yourself, uh, we are given a nice T-pose of a character. In this case, this is Tommy might not might know from our default geometry, our test geometry library. But here we've just pulled him off to a nice T-pose and taken off all his clothes because we're going to give him some nice new clothes to work with. But we're also given another sequence which has been produced for us. And this is a walk cycle. And so this is Tommy again. And we can see here that uh, if I play, he's walking in place until uh, he isn't. Because there's only uh, 24 frames of this walk cycle. So the first thing I need to do is obviously get this walk cycle to actually cycle rather than just only do 24 frames of animation and stop. So in Houdini 17, we have a new retime node. And uh, this retime node is also accessible under the name time warp. We had a time warp node before, but now that node is hidden because if we do time warp, we're actually going to put down a retime because it's got a slightly better interface for doing this sort of stuff. So in this case, I happen to know that my input frame range is uh, 1 to 24. And what I want to have it do after it's hit the end of the input frame range is um, I, I could de stick with this default here, which is to, um, to hold. Um, but I don't really want to hold. I want to cycle. So I just change this to post cycle. And now I'll get a cycle and walk animation. If we look at this carefully, you're going to notice um, it's a little bit jerky. And um, this is also because we're currently retiming a single walk cycle to 100 frames. And that's what this output frame range is. So if we want to, if we made the match, we'll get a real time frame for frame correspondence. So now we're matching exactly what came in to the input. Uh, but we've decided we want a little more of a leisurely stroll than this. He's uh, marching too hard here. So let's cut this down and take 48 frames to uh, complete a cycle. And so with this, he's uh, walking slower, but you're seeing this jerkiness. And this is because we're not doing any subframe interpolation. So I can just ask it, please interpolate between frames. And there we go. And we now have smooth subframe data. And the nice thing about interpolating between frames is I also know that uh, when the solver takes a look at this and asks for subframe data, it will get good results. So this walk cycle's uh, in place. I want this to actually move forward. So I can do a transform sop and uh, have it move along his walk-in direction. And his walk-in direction is in plus Z here. And I can take the time, and if I know his speed, I can just multiply it by the speed. Don't know the speed offhand, so let's just call the speed speed. Uh, and this is a channel reference pointing to speed, but I don't have a speed channel right now. So I'm going to go to the parameter interface and move this on the screen so you can see it, and just pull over a float parameter for myself to hold the speed value. Put it at the very top there called speed speed, and hit accept. And now we have a speed parameter. So I can choose how fast he walks. Um, so that is obviously too fast and he's skating. Um, and something like 4-4, four, four. he's now walking. He's definitely still skating here. Let's see if I remember the correct speed for Tommy. So that's too slow. What was it? There we go, 0 0.8, I'm getting good foot plants. Now, ideally, um, whoever animated this would have known the speed and provided it to me. But uh, I'm just working here with raw geometry and trying to get my shot done. So now I've got uh, him walking, bend him in a T pose. But now I need uh, a transition between the two. And let's first make sure these two things match up. If you don't have point-to-point -point correspondences, you end up very sad at this point. Uh, so it's always good to run a sequence blend and just make sure that things don't go to infinity and beyond. And sure enough, here we have actually a good sequence blend, so everything's nice. Um, so what I can do now is actually just blend this over time. So um, keyframe this on frame one to be in T pose, jump forward 10 frames, and let's make this the uh, walk cycle on the frame, fr frame 10. And now when I hit play, we have something that goes into the walk cycle and then plays. So I've got my setup here, and now I want to put some clothes on them. So let's start off with a nice t-shirt for Tommy. And so I'm going to put a draw curve on. And this draw curve I'm going to use to basically template the Tommy. I'll template the static one rather than the 
animated one there in case I change my frame range. And we can see here I've got this area that I'm going to draw on. And so I'm going to zoom in a bit and draw over where I, where I want the uh, T-shirt the to be. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a separate line for each seam in the T-shirt. So I'm not drawing this as a continuous curve. I'm doing a series of curves, each in the same direction, the same line. But I'm also not worried at all about the quality of my lines here because I plan on basically editing it later. I'm going to be resampling this down to practically nothing, fusing it up, and then doing edits later to control the actual shape. So I'd enter to go into the draw curve mode and uh, shrink the size of this so it's not so obvious. And let's draw the upper part there, then one side panel, and then the bottom panel across like that. Another side panel, oh, that's rather disgusting. Uh, I'll blame it this on using a mouse. Normally I have a tablet um, and where I can draw much worse stuff faster. And bring this up for this side, and the little bit at the top, and the big V neck, and then another little bit at the top there. So if I look at the uh, point display for this, we can see a whole bunch of ugly little points. So I'm going to resample it and get it down to a lot fewer points, much more easier to control. And now run a big fuse, and I'm going to grow the size of this fuse just to snap everything together. So I've got one set of points here. Now I can how I want to basically turn this into a piece of cloth. We have a set of planar tools now. In this case, I'm going to use planar patch from curves. So this takes a curve network and tries to fill it in with triangles as best as I can. So if I throw this in as it is, uh, we can see it has carefully maintained all my exterior points and added interior um, points at this 0.1 interior edge length. I want a slightly higher resolution. Let's go to 0.04. But you see it's, again, carefully maintained these exterior points. But these weren't carefully placed points. These were just rough guidance points. So I had to resample those input curves. And um, now, however, it's, when it resampled it, it resampled on those edges. So it kept all the sharp edges I had from this, uh, this rough resampled geometry uh, here. Um, but I'd rather just have it smooth it out. Now, one thing we do have in Houdini is, of course, subdivision curves. So I can say uh, smooth subdivision curves. And now I have nice smooth uh, triangles here. Now, the output of from planar patch from curves is not just a bunch of triangles, but it's also able to output seam groups. And the seam groups allows me to tell what, um, refer to these particular points along these curves later, which is very important when I want to weld these together and make multiple patches work together. So I'm going to first call this the front, because this will be the front. And now I'm going to also uh, transform that forward a bit. Sorry. And so with this transform sop, put the front panel. Sorry, let me get this. So I'm hitting the wrong key here. Transform. Let me try this again. Transform uh, this node. Ah, oh, there it is. I was looking in the wrong place for the transform node. And it was, of course, at the bottom. And let's move this forward a little bit like that. And let's uh, now repeat this operation to make the back. And so now we have the front and the back of the, the shirt, and I can merge those together. And now I've got the uh, two pieces of my garment that I want to sort of weld together. Now um, I'll now create a vellum configure cloth to turn this into cloth. And I can do a vellum solver. Uh, I'm actually going to do, there's vellum solver I can do. I'll do that first. And um, also apply the uh, Tommy geometry so that we have a something for us to collide with. So grab the output of that sequence blend and put in as my collision geometry. And now if I hit play, we will successfully see the two pieces of cloth fall down and be pushed off by Tommy who's walking forward. But we don't want these floating in space like this. We want to actually try and uh, join these together. And to do that, rather than using the vellum solver, we have another node called vellum drape. Vellum drape is very much like a vellum solver in that if I hit play right now, you're going to see the um, cloth fall down. But you'll note the guide geometry is not animated. One of the big things it does is freeze the guide geometry in that first frame um, because the idea, the, the idea of this node is I'm just trying to drape clothes onto this mannequin. So I don't want that sequence animation at this point. I just want to try and outside of the normal time of the animation 
do something dynamically to get these points here to be welded together, um, but I don't want to snap them together, it'll be too quick. So first I need to identify those points. And I can go to vellum drape and say weld additional seams. And here I can specify a group and uh, I could type in the point numbers in a certain order, but it's a lot easier if I can have procedurally named groups because then I can change them later and they'll still work. The problem right now though is that I don't have different group names for my front and back. This planar patch from curves, I turned on seam groups, so I have a group for each one of the seams, but they're called front in both the front piece and the back piece. So what I can do instead is I can use a group rename node and put this on the back path here and ask it to please uh, rename um, anything called front to back. And now I will look here and see that I have back seams and there, and when I merge them together, I put the back and the front seams. So now let us strip this together. I'm going to start off with the group. I'll grab back seam zero. And we can see as soon as I grab that, it selected um, these points and welded them to the first ones I could find, which are probably not the ones I actually want to weld it to. And back seam zero, I don't want to actually weld. So I'll change it to back seam one, which is this left side here. And I can weld that then to front seam one. And in this case, we're lucky. There's a direct one-to-one -one correspondence between the points, and it's in the correct order. Sometimes you'll find, because you mirror the geometry, that they all crisscross over each other because one point group is in the opposite order of the other. In that case, you can simply hit reverse, and it will reverse it, as it suggests. Other times, you might end up with a cycle where something starts off off by one than the other, so this can help correct those issues as well. Now, I want to wire another um, weld up. The temptation is to keep adding more uh, groups here, because I can do back uh, seam three and front seam three, and then I successfully welded the other side. Unfortunately, this does not actually um, scale very well. The problem is there's a very subtle difference of how Houdini generates this resulting group than one would expect. What I would expect is it would take all the points of back seam one in their specific order, and then add all the points in back seam three in the specific order. Unfortunately, what it does instead is for each group, see if it matches this field, and if it does, add all the points of that group. So if it decides to use back seam three first, it will actually um, put the, group, the points of back seam three in first, and then back seam one, despite being written in this order here. So to avoid that surprise, I recommend instead just using a separate um, group for each um, weld you're due. And this also lets you more easily turn off specific welds to, if they don't work right and uh, figure out what's going on. So I can do here the front to the back for seam three. And we can see that's enabled. And let's add a couple more. Oops, I did not mean to change cycle there. And so this would thus be back seam five and front seam five. And if I want to be fancy, I don't have to go in a particular direction here. So I can do front seam seven and back seam seven. So now I've uh, defined welds between all these points. So what has this node done? Um, this node has done two things. First, it's defined a stitch constraint, which is a soft constraint of strength 1000 with zero distance uh, to pull these particular pieces together. So when I start simulating, they're going to be not snapped together instantly, but are pulled together with some dynamic forces. And then after the 10 frames of welding de delay that's specified, it's actually going to snap them together and fuse them into a single piece of fabric. And after it has fused them into a single piece of fabric, it'll then turn on gravity and let everything come to a rest. So let's see how well this worked. So we have it come through, it snaps together, and I actually did pretty well here. Um, one thing you will notice, though, at this point is we um, have an intersection here. This part of his t-shirt is actually going right through his body uh, after it's snapped together. We can step back individual frames, and we'll see on frame 10, um, when it was just still solving, um, it hadn't been able to pull those together because it's just simply not enough fabric there. And so when it snapped them together, it had to go through the body, and then we end up with a bad drape as a result. Sometimes you'll be willing to live with that. In this case, we aren't. And so we can go up and adjust our tailoring to give more space for uh, Tommy to be able to support that. So I can go back up here to the um, original curve network, which I have up here, and um, adjust, adjust it here. So I can put an edit stop down after the fuse. I'm going to display this edit, and I hit enter to enter the edit state. Um, if you're, you, I can now select the points here, 
Uh, where's point selection? Now, one thing to note is we currently have the secure selection mode, and this is currently off right now. Um, if this toggle was uh, set was locked, we'd be in serious, secure select mode, and before you can select, you'd have to um, this you'd have to hit S to enable selection. Um, so in this case, it is off, so I'm able to actually um, select points directly by going to points and select these points. And now I can just pull this point out or pull this point out a bit. And now I've given Tommy a bit more room uh, for this particular part of the graph. And you can see the um, surrounding uh, network retopologizes and um, updates itself for that. And if I go back to the results of the drape, um, we now have more room there. Let's see if there's enough room for it to snap together. Nope, still probably not enough. Let's try a more extreme edit here. I don't want it too flappy either. Let's do something like that. He does have a, such a triangular build. There we go. Now we have still a little bubble in there, so any real tailor would be rather disgusted with my uh, job here, but uh, this is more just to show what is possible. So we've got the uh, top half of uh, Tommy's set. Now let's get something to cover up the bottom half. And so for this, I'm going to put another planar. Um, patch. And so the planar patch tools have some high level tools that uh, just let you generate rather than have to specify curves all the time, rectangles and um, trapezoids with uh, taper, uh, circles, and also ring type geometry. So these are ways to quickly get these 2D shapes if you need to uh, hook stuff up. They also have seam control so you can output the groups for the different parts of the, the thing. So in this case, I want to um, take a look at what Tommy looks like so I can place this in a reasonable position. And let's uh, move this up as a um, front panel for, for Tommy. Make it a little bit shorter. And I also want to make it a bit trapezoidal. I mean, it doesn't have to be too trapezoidal. We'll often squishing the top level works very well for this sort of uh, outfit. Um, but I'll go to trapezoid, um, top, and taper it a little bit here. And I'll change the size to match the, the other size. And now let's take this and let's attach it to our um, front seam. So um, we now do a configure cloth to turn this into a cloth object. And now we have a little bit of a tricky bit here because we have uh, two things we need to merge together to pass this down. Um, actually, first of all, I should point out we don't want to have this output with these stitches on. What we want to actually start for our next stage of draping is the actual draped simulation. So around frame 20 here, um, we have something draped, which, uh, which we're sort of happy with. So what we can do in the vellum drape is say freeze at frame. And so this basically does a time shift internally so that uh, no matter what time I have here, I'm always going to see frame 20. I can also save this particular uh, frame to disk. And that way I don't have to re-simulate when I re reload Houdini. Um, which A, can take a lot of time, and B, there's always the, the danger you've changed something else, and so it won't re-simulate exactly the same way. So if you have a, a drape you really like, you probably should save it to disk as a, a single result. Um, so given this particular drape now, I wish to add in this front panel of cloth. So I need to do a merge, and I need, in this case, to do uh, two merges because I want to um, merge both the geometry, the display geometry that we see, but also the uh, constraint network that's underneath it. And so in this case, this is the constraints of the first one and constraints of the second. And both of these, I wired them up the wrong way there because I want my new piece of cloth to go after all the others. This way, any point numbers that are hard-coded inside that original piece of cloth will continue to be valid. And I need to make sure my new um, ones are both merged in the exact same order because it's important we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points of this gray input and the points of the pink input. So I always have to do these merges together. If I only merged on one input, uh, chaos would result. So now I can do a vellum drape of this uh, resulting uh, network, which has two pieces in it. And so uh, this is the constraints and the other one. And I can bring in my collision geometry again. And if I hit play, we should see the um, front panel just fall downwards, because obviously we need to actually stitch it together. So let's add the stitch into this, weld additional seams. 
Uh, if I go to my planar patch, I can tell it to add a top seam, and um, which will be called, let's call this uh, front. And then I'll use front for the other ones, I won't work too well. Um, let's call it uh, kilt. No, this isn't not quite a kilt, it's much more of a dress actually. And so I can say the kilt top, and I want to weld this to the front seam six, I think. Well, look, no, that's obviously wrong. Front seam four. Get this right at some point. Uh, front seam two. There we go. Now, if I play here, we can see we now pull the two pieces together. And on frame 10, we weld them together. And then we add gravity, so the whole thing starts to fall down and drape. Um, but we have this whole section here hanging off the edge. And that's because we had more points in the top of the kilt than we had in the um, bottom of the t-shirt. And it's important for the two point counts to match precisely because that's how the welding is done. Welding must always be point to point. It can't weld to inside of a triangle. Ideally, um, this would be handled for you. And the thing that sets up these curve con seam constraint networks could adjust them automatically. But we don't have that right now. So currently, you have to do this by hand. So if I middle click here, I can see that my front seam two that I was looking at has um, do, 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 15 points in it. And so I need 15 points on the top of my kilt. And so here I can say, override the top points and please make it 15. And now I'll have exactly 15 points on the top. And now we'll see that this lines up precisely. And I can hit play and get the, uh, the dress on. Now that's one half. Now let's get the other half on. So for the other half, I will um, just basically repeat this planar patch process. I might call it uh, kilt back so I can tell it apart. And move it behind, like so. And then merge this together before we do the conversion um, to cloth. And now with the drapes, I can add another one, which is for the kilt back top. And I know this will be the back seam too. And so now we have these two matched up. Now likewise, I need these two halves of the uh, planar patch to match up. And so I can output the left and rights. So left seam and right seam, and the left seam and the right seam. And now in Velm Trape, add two more welds between the kilt left and the kilt back right, or is it the kilt back left? Stage left or stage right? Um, oops, I put them in the same area. That obviously won't work. Kilt left. And that was the wrong one. I had it right the first time. Just I put it in the wrong group. So there we go. And now let's do the same here. Kilt back left. There we go. So now we have all of the uh, pieces lined up. If I play, and I'll snap together in frame 10. And then we'll fall under gravity. And create a nice dress for Tommy. So a good stable frame for this around frame 65 or so. So let's just uh, freeze this on frame 60. And now we have a draped Tommy. Now we want to now run this through our actual animation geometry. So we've been passed that down, that extra input. So if we just switch to the vellum solver at this point. Uh, we'll then get um, the animation. And so this will now solve on the animated Tommy. One thing you'll notice here is this dress is stretchy. Um, it was not the stretchy when we were draping it. And the reason is, is during the draping process, um, one thing we do is we set a time scale of 0.2. And this uh, basically slows down time. So you're seeing um, every sub-step of something running at one-fifth the speed. And uh, that basically lets you um, get faster iterations and feedback because that's usually the most important thing for um, feeling like you're getting things moving fast and seeing if it's moving the right way. But also, but it's often not running at the actual speed you need. So in this case, we probably need five sub-steps to actually run the simulation. And our default for the Velm solver is very aggressive. 
uh, and sets to one just to get the fastest possible result. But in this case, I can change it to five. And now we have uh, Tommy um, move in with a dress um, pro and properly not being stretched too much. If you still get additional stretch at this point, you might want to increase the constraint iterations. Um, they should usually be set to the, the sort of distance in uh, polygons from one edge of the dress to the other. So 100 is probably actually reasonable in this case if you have enough sub-steps. So having got a dress for Tommy, I'd like to also try and do something a little bit different with it and try and make a multiple layered dress. And so for this, I'm going to um, take our drape that we had here and uh, fuse it together and tr get rid of all the constraints we actually have right now on it. So what you can do is you can just extract the geometry by itself um, without any of the other pieces and do the vellum post-process. And vellum post-process here will apply welds. And what this will do will fuse together um, these corners here. And so we'll end up with them actually uh, as single points rather than pairs of points. So now I have like one continuous piece of fabric with all these uh, wrinkles baked into it. So when, when I turn this into a cloth later, it will bake in all of these uh, angles and distances. So it'll keep these, I'll try and keep these particular wrinkles, which often actually is what people want at this point. And it'll also get rid of any of the energy in the system. So stuff like uh, along this waste was uh, compressed previously, and now it'll no longer be seen as compressed because these will just become the natural rest and distances for it. Uh, one problem you notice here is uh, the way I assembled this, and this is where this uh, uh, blue background shading is kind of useful, is I've got my normals backwards for half of my dress. Um, so I need to make this all normalized, so uh, make it all point the same way. Uh, Polydoctor has a, an option to basically uh, topology, um, correct winding numbers to the majority. And in this case, I'll probably pick it at random, but thankfully here I picked the right direction, so I might have to reverse it. And so I've got outward facing normals here. So given this dress, I can do a volume configure cloth. And now I've just created a fresh new piece of cloth so I could change my um, settings for everything here. Um, and, and now do a vellum solver. And I can bring in the, the same collision geometry I used previously. And we will get the similar result. So again, I probably want to increase my sub-steps very quickly here. The other thing to always look at when you're at this point, or possibly earlier, is your thickness. Uh, because in this case, for example, um, if these green circles were too big, then everything would turn to cyan on the second frame because they were actually shrunk. And so in this case, I'm fortunate. They're about the right size. But if I had any more high-resolution geometry, I'd probably have to decrease my thickness. Uh, having it too big will give you strange artifacts and slow down the simulation for no real benefit. Actually, I think I will reduce the thickness a little bit here. Make it... Uh, Half the, half the thickness it was before. Because I want to do multiple layers, and that will give me more room to put the different layers in. Um, now, to do the layers, I don't want to redo all that work of making it. So I'm going to use the poor man's solution of just using the peak sop here. And so the peak sop lets me just push things up by like uh, 0.01. And if I do that again, I can create a series of layers that are slightly fatter than the other and then merge, merge these together, starting from the, uh, s the lowest to the highest. And now let's do a connectivity. I just want to color them randomly, so uh, connectivity by point, and then color. I can choose a random color from that point attribute. And now I've got uh, four randomly colored layers. Let's put that into our configure cloth. And we can make sure again that our um, thickness is not uh, too bad, so it isn't. We actually get away with that. So now we have a very fat dress that is uh, being put on Tommy here. So when working with multiple layers like this, um, one of the things that can go wrong is you can start to get collision failures. Um, curious if we'll get them in this case. If not, I guess I can probably easily introduce them by um, doing a uh, reducing the number of sub steps down. 
and so this becomes a more aggressive solve. So we can see on the front here, we've definitely uh, got a lot of collision fa failures where it's no longer resolving these layers properly. If I go to the, the Visualize page, there's an option for failed self-collisions. And so what happens is if a point ends up in a position it can't actually uh, solve for the correct collisions, it basically puts this flag on and it'll turn itself off from all future collisions, uh, self-collisions in this case. Which it'll, and, but if it ever gets resolved because the layers separate again, it'll turn itself back on again. So this stops the solver from exploding or freezing up. Um, it just means you'll get um, possibly ugly results, but at least you'll get results at the end of the day. That's the number one required property here. To try and address those um, collisions, obviously one would be to increase sub-steps, which we did earlier, but we're trying to show other approaches here. The other choice is in the post-collision pass. Usually increasing this can be helpful, uh, especially when you have multiple layers. Uh, the default is um, best pr probably for single layers. So with multiple layers, I've put that up to six, and actually already I see um, it's not nearly as bad as it was on the previous one. The other thing you can do is give a hint to Vellum that there is layers here, and they have a priority. And so if I add a layer attribute, and I can actually do this by um, just reusing that class attribute I had before. So I'm going to just do an attribute wrangle. Oops. And just set the layer attribute to be the um, class attribute. Um, I, now the Vellum solver has an option on it for what's called layer shock. And so this controls the relative mass when two pieces of cloth collide. So if there's a layer attribute on the cloth and one of the layers is higher than the other, it will be made four times lighter than the one below it. So the, the higher numbered layers are the ones that should be floating on top of the lower level numbered layers. And because of that um, shock setting, we're going to end up with um, the, the top layer being pushed out preferentially and then we're able to ensure that the outer dress always remains on the top. There's a loss of uh, simulation fidelity here because it doesn't become a truly coupled solve. We start making it a weakly coupled solve where the outer layer sort of affects but doesn't affect strongly the layers below. But it's not as extreme as if you just baked out the bottom layer of garments and then solved the layer on top. You are still doing them together. It's just you're controlling how strongly that interaction is. So the um, other thing to point out is you don't have to use an attribute angle for that. If I'd set this up differently, I would have been able to use the um, Vellum configure cloth because there's actually an ability to set the layer there. So often you have multiple pieces, you can just set the layer inside this option here to control how they work. So thank you very much. Now we have uh, Tommy, and he has a nice uh, four-layer dress on, which I think will be shown in all the, uh, the best places of Paris fashion. And uh, again, I will save this file so it's available to you. And I hope you enjoy. and. Uh, have good use out of this. Thank you.